Remember. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. His grace is sufficient, sing your grace. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for Shot yet. Oh, no duck lips or oh, sign. Do you want duck lips or no duck lips? What is duck lips? D now All video, right, take cool. one. Oh, I guess that means we should be ready. Well, we got to get ready. That's true. Because we don't know exactly. Um, How's this going to flow? Right. Do we want to be funny? Or we just want to be handsome? Or so we should probably introduce ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready? And Do you want to go first? Well, I'll say my name, Chris Reeser, and then you. Uh, John Lowe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What is D now? I wonder where that you came want... from. I, mean, oh, I, do, I don't know that D one. now. I mean, why, they, why didn't they call it, you know, S now? For? Um, scripture now. Oh, no. no disciple now. What about D now? Disciple. Disciple. D. That's the, yes, the gotcha. D. Um, February 21st through 23rd. I think I just forgot about that. Okay. I just had to register by, we gotta, I know we got to register by the 9th. Which is next week. Right. So we, we'll have to address. So we need to really do this. Yeah. 
That's why we're doing this. Right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then how about you explain what they get okay. for like 40 bucks? Like, like a t-shirt. Yeah. T-shirts. Time in a host home for two nights. Yeah. Time with good. a college age Bible study leader. Um, Which, uh, they need to bring, they'll need to bring a, like a sleeping bag and a pillow and a Bible and some recreation. Lots of recreation. The middle school students are doing a race. Yes, yeah, an adventure race. And the high school yeah. students, we're going to do a mega relay. All right, we'll cover that. And there's going to be yeah. music. Yeah. Reverb. Uh, reverb. 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 That's right. And <laughs> we're going to talk about how they, they're going to influence uh, tens of thousands of people over the course of their life. and. Um, I, I want to make sure that they're influencing people to come to know Christ. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. All right. I, I like think it. we can talk about it now. All right. We're ready. Cool. We're All good. right. Here we go. Or you could have just had the pastor say it's $40 sign up, but next Sunday, February 21, get here, all right? So the table's out in the foyer, be there. Hey, all of you uh, middle school, high school, don't forget it, it's coming up. Also, men's conference sign up begins today, the ladies retreat that's going on one of our classes out there today. Uh, a lot of things in the foyer. Welcome to all of you on this Sunday morning. Glad that you are here. In a few moments, we're going to be uh, transitioning our worship toward the Lord's Supper table. We'll come right here. I'll open the Word of God, give you a biblical explanation. We'll talk about it. Then we'll share that together, speaking of the unity of the bride of Christ. So thank you for coming on this day. It's an important day, always a good day when we share the Lord's Supper together here at Olive. Bless the Lord, oh my soul.
This morning as we come to give our offering unto the Lord, I encourage you to be a tither 
encourage you that uh, you're faithful with your giving unto the Lord. I'll be giving in this service as many as you will. And so I just want to remind you that when you give here, you do a multitude of things. You do a lot of things right here. You do many things in Pensacola, you do things across America. Uh, that just goes out like concentric circles, like ripples across a pond when a rock is thrown in. We have a group in Ghana this morning to pray for them. They have finally got there, and so uh, pray for our church plants up in the Northeast. So you do those things with mission. You go out, but you do some very pragmatic things right here. We take the Lord's Supper today and bring these elements uh, together. You provide so that we uh, do that. Uh, other larger ticket items. There's a brand new piano sitting on the platform uh, this morning. Dr. Day started uh, that. We were going toward getting that done several months ago. And uh, as we have opportunity and money is good, then we're able to do that because the other one was shot and wouldn't hold a tune. We had to get rid of it. And uh, uh, so thank God for you. You give. You do things. Very pragmatic right here. But you do things that scatter from this place in ministry. D now is one of those. And uh, with the men's conference, a lot of other things. So let's be found faithful. I'm going to pray. We'll give. The choir will sing. I'll open the Word of God, and then we will come to the Lord's table today and share the bread and the cup as we remember the source of our salvation. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For redemption thank you for grace thank you for forgiveness and thank you that we are secure in your hand we come now to give our gifts to you not to repay you but to invest in this kingdom work and to give honor unto your name and it's in the name of King Jesus we pray and give. Amen. You be seated. Gentlemen, go receive the gifts of God's good people. You go, Brother Wayne.
As you're seated, find your place in your gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 21 and 22, and then in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. We come to the Lord's Supper table today, and we observe the ordinances of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 21 and 22, the Word of God says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? And then in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, Paul says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is, in remem which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. The ordinances of the New Testament church are two. Baptism, as you have seen already, and the Lord's Supper that we will partake in a moment. These are sermons without words. They are pictures of the gospel. Baptism, when that candidate is placed under the water, it symbolizes Jesus going in the grave. When they are brought out of the water, it symbolizes Jesus getting up on the third day, the resurrection of our Lord. 
his death, his resurrection. When we come to the Lord's table, we remember that his body was broken for us. The bread is an unleavened bread. Jesus' life had no sin in it. As the Israelites left Egypt, they took bread and they were going in a hurry. The bread was unleavened as they went out. There was nothing, you know, you put in it. It was not made to rise. Jesus said a little leaven leavens the whole lump and it is emblematic of our own sin. Jesus had no sin and he was broken in purity for you and for me. We then take the cup, the cup of the new covenant of his blood. There was an old covenant, but there's a new covenant, this text says. The old covenant was one of the law. This is the new covenant of grace. It was the old covenant where we had to make our own sacrifice. The new covenant it is the new covenant of God's sacrifice for us. When he stooped to save us, it, it's a covenant, like a marriage covenant. When you get married, it's like a triangle. Man, woman, and God. If you just have a man and a woman come together, you've got what man can do. But when that man and that woman are committed to the Father in covenant relationship, then God is flowing through that man and that woman in this covenant relationship. And you are not just in covenant with your spouse, but you are keeping that covenant as you are in covenant with the Father. Therefore, there is a strength within that covenant marital relationship. We have a covenant with the Father made of blood through the Lamb. And he has come to us and we are in covenant with him. The Lord's table, the baptistry. They are beautiful pictures, but they have been perverted in our world. Hear me very quickly this morning. First of all, with the perversion of baptism. Baptism is perverted in many ways, but I name just three. Number one is infant baptism. We do not baptize infants, nor did they in the New Testament. Now there are some brothers and sisters, great and good men of faith, who believe that when one was saved and it talked about the whole household, that it would bring their family, and therefore they now baptize their infants when they get saved, and they believe that they are in covenant with the Father through them. But hear me, nowhere in the Bible do we find anything but an adult someone who knew Christ themselves being baptized. You hear me, when you get up to judgment and you will, God will ask you some questions and when you get there, you will not be able to look over and say, Mama, what's the answer? You will stand there for yourself and you should be baptized when you are ready, when God has called you and when you've been saved. You don't do that for your mama, your daddy, your sister, your brother, your preacher. You do it because Christ has called you. Therefore, we dedicate children, we do not baptize them. We give children emblematically back to the Lord Jesus and sacrifice, but we do not baptize them. Number two is that of regenerational baptism. There are some who believe when you walk into that baptistry that you have your sins washed away in baptism. No, 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 a thousand times no. It is not baptismal water, but the blood of the Lord Jesus that washes your sin, cleans you from your filthy indignation. It is only the blood of the Lamb, not the waters of baptism that cleanse your soul. Thirdly is what I call non-immersion. Now many of our friends today sprinkle and pour and if they want to do that, that's fine. But the only way you ever find baptism in the New Testament is the way you saw it here this morning and that is when someone is lowered into the water and brought out of the water. Uh, non-immersion. Uh, they've done it for convenience or a thousand other things and many when you were going to baptize an infant, you surely would not uh, do immersion to an infant but you would touch or sprinkle or pour. But baptism is that of immersion. You see, I want to be baptized like Jesus. I also want to be buried like Jesus. Just to run a quick rabbit here this morning, I am asked over and over about cremation. It, it is one of the most off-asked questions in the last two years of ministry. Is it okay to cremate my mama or that's what they wanted? Is that okay to do? Well, nowhere in the Bible do you really find that laid out in clarity. 
But the only thing by implication, and that by implication is not enough to make a doctrine or even a principle, but is something I stay away from because the only people I find in the Old Testament that cremated their dead were the pagans. That does not mean you are a pagan if you've had someone cremated. As I said, I do not make an ordinance or a law or even a principle out of that because I do not find it in writ, but I do find the way Jesus was buried is the way I want to be buried. And the way that Jesus was baptized was by immersion is the way I want to be baptized. So if you live long enough to see me dead and you come to my funeral, you'll find me in a box, uh, not in a container of dust. That's the way I want to go. And if anybody cremates me, I'm coming out of there to have something to say about it. <laughs> we pervert baptism if we're not careful. We can also pervert the Lord's Supper table three ways I've just mentioned quickly. Number one is by what I call open communion. Now some of you that are long, old time Baptists, hear me quickly because what I mean by open communion is not what our forefathers long ago meant. There was a day that if you were not a member on the roll at Olive Baptist Church, you could not take this Lord's Supper. If you were a member at First Baptist Church or Jay or Baghdad or Pensacola, anywhere else, you were not invited to the Lord's Supper table here because you were not a member of that local fellowship. That's not what I mean by open communion. That's closed communion, and open was when you would let uh, other churches come in in days gone by. We do not practice that here. If you're a believer and have been baptized or following after Christ and believe the doctrines of the New Testament, you're welcome at this table today. But open communion where we pervert the Lord's table is where we say, let anybody come, saved and lost. This table is for saved people only. Even your children, my kids were small and that plate would come by and they'd want bread and they were not saved. I said, no, it's not for you. It opens up a great question. I know we live in a world today where you can't tell a kid no. Everybody gets a prize, everybody gets a trophy, everybody gets a ribbon, everybody. Well, let me tell you, you gotta get lost before you can get saved. And a great teaching way is for your children to understand there are those that are inside the faith and those that are outside. And this is a great tool, a sermon that preaches without words. We pervert the Lord's Supper with open communion. Number two is by private observance. I'm having this uh, more and more where young couples that come to me and they want to get married and they want to take the Lord's Supper at their wedding and I will not do it. And the reason I will not do it is uh, not because I don't believe in the Lord's Supper and they oughtn't to be in communion, but, but hear me. The Lord's Supper is not for a group to watch somebody else do. The Lord's Supper is not an ordinance of marriage, it is an ordinance of the church. Communion is not about a husband and a wife communing together, it is about believers communing with the Father and communing with one another. So when you go to a wedding, it's not for you to watch for them to do the Lord's Supper just here by themselves. Uh, the private observance cuts out the church. This is an ordinance of the church. We do it all together. It's the unity of the bride of Christ. And thirdly, uh, there are those that pervert the Lord's Supper finding salvation in communion. There are those who believe that when the preacher stands here and prays that this bread and this wine uh, literally become the body and the blood of the Lord. It's a doctrine known as transubstantiation. The substance is transformed. Trans change substantiation substance that it changes the substance. This is not, this substance will not change. You are not literally taking the body and blood of our Lord today. It is emblematic, it is symbolic, it, it is there for us to remember uh, as a symbol. It's not a mere symbol, it's more than that uh, as we come together here, but it is symbolic. Those that believe in transubstantiation believe that when you take this, that you literally take the body of our Lord and, and therefore you are receiving salvation. You don't get saved by receiving this bread or this cup. You get saved by receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Invite him to step into your heart and forgive your sin. That's how one is saved. Three words I want you to remember very quickly this morning. One, two, three. You see them. I've outlined them there for you. Memory, faith, and hope. Three words. Notice in our text today, in chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, uh, that Paul knew that when the Lord did the Lord's Supper for the first time, he took the bread and he said, do this in remembrance of me. When he took the cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me. 
memory. When you receive this today, I want you to look back to the cross. Remember, dear friend, hear me. It was agony. Jesus died. His heart broke. His body bled. And his spirit died. Never forget the price of Calvary. That's what this is to remind us of. When you hold that element, remember what the Lord has done to save you. Secondly is the word faith. Notice in verse number 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. You proclaim it, hallelujah. You proclaim it till he comes. You proclaim the covenant of faith until he comes. Amen. It's proclamation. I believe it. We were singing this song. Rachel was standing over here, and I was patting my foot, and, and she put up three fingers, and she said, but on the third day, and in my mind, I thought, Lord, what if that really is true? What if you really did get up out of the grave? What if you really are alive today? Lord Jesus, what, what if you are sitting at the right hand and you really died? My Lord, it ought to change the church, amen? You don't just go through some hocus pocus and walk out of here and never think, I'm telling you, if he got up, it ought to change everything we do. Remember and proclaim. And thirdly, by hope, you proclaim the Lord's death. How long? Till he comes. Hey, I got, I got news for you today. <laughs> he's coming back. Can I get a witness? Uh, I'm telling you, he's going to get up and come. He's going to rise, and, and the father's going to say, go get your children. I tell you, I've been to the graveyard way too many times the last two months. I've been there with young and old and everything in between. I'll tell you, it's been, it's been as hard two months of my life burying people as I've ever had. Got another one coming up this week with Oma Lee Lynn. Oh, what a sweet, sweet lady. Brother John and I saw her in the hospital. Just the other day I walked in. They were taking her to hospice, and she died in just a few hours. I looked at Oma Lee, and I said, how do you want me to pray? She's in her right mind. She, looked, she said, just pray, Pastor, that the Lord is with me on the journey. I'm telling you, she knew he's coming. And I prayed for that. I've often told people when we go out here to Bayview, where we've been several times of late, that we bury people with their head to the west and their feet to the east. The Lord's coming out of the east. The reason your feet's that way is because your head's this way, so when he comes and you sit up, you'll see him coming. That's the way, that's why we bury people like we do. You'll get out there and you'll always hear somebody whispering, which, which end's the head, which end's the head? They're always whispering that, put the head at this end, put the head down here. You don't want to get buried backwards. You sit up backwards, you turn your back on the Lord when he comes. <laughs> That's the symbol. We, we get up and, and there comes our Lord. I had a lady told me this morning, or, or this week, she, she said, Pastor, uh, we bought uh, cemetery plots out at Bayview because it's the only waterfront property we'll ever own all our life. That's what we want. <laughs> she said, we'll see the Lord coming across the bay. Hallelujah, what a good day it'll be when we see the Lord rising in glory. You proclaim the Lord's death how long? Till he comes. Come. Bless God, that's our hope. That's our hope. He's coming again. Now I want to give you one last word and then we're going to come to the table. Take your Bible and I want you to go all the way over to the end of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 16 and you'll get down there to 1 Corinthians 16 and I want us to start something at Olive as a new tradition. Get right to the end. Now it's not verse 20. Yeah, that, that's not the new tradition at Olive, that we greet each other with a holy kiss, all right? Can I get a witness? Yeah. Amen. But in verse 22, I want you to notice, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. And here's the word, say it with me, Maranatha. Maranatha. And you know, it's the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Jesus Christ. In just a moment we're going to pass the elements. And when we do, here's what I want you to do. 
whenever someone hands you the tray and you're about to take it from them, I want you to look them in the eye and I want you to say this word, Maranatha. I want this to become our tradition at Olive. And when you greet people in the church, I want you to begin to use that word, Maranatha. So when David takes this tray and hands it to Tommy, and Tommy will look him in the eye and he'll say, Maranatha. What does that word mean? It's an Aramaic word, not a Greek word. It can mean several things. It can be two words put together or it can be one. In one place, it can mean he is Lord. The other, usually translated means until the Lord comes again or he is coming again. So when you're greeting one another and saying Maranatha, you're saying he's Lord until he comes again, until he comes again. What a great way to remember in the Lord's Supper as you pass that element to simply say Maranatha, until he comes again. I'm gonna ask our deacon leaders to come and join me here. I'm going to lead us as we pray. We will share, first of all, the bread it is the broken body of our Lord. If you are with us here today in a Christ follower, take this piece of bread, hold it, and we will take it all together showing our unity in the faith. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. And Lord Jesus, thank you for going to the cross for us. We by faith now remember in Jesus' name. Maranatha. Gentlemen, go and serve the bride of Christ. God bless you, friend. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote? That sacred head for sinners such as I. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown. What's well, hard for me to fathom, 2,000 years ago in a little upper room, well, it was different than we're doing now. It was rough and rugged, breaking that bread. But through the years, trial, tribulation, revival, rebellion, the church has continued to remember, never forgetting its Savior, its head, the one that gave his life. Be thankful for his death and eat all of it. Father, we are grateful people that you gave your life for us. Thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for going to Calvary. We remember now and give thanks. Maranatha. Gentlemen, come and serve the bride of Christ.
book of Hebrews says that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of your sin now be mindful no matter how good you are no forgiveness no matter how hard you work good things you may do in the church there's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood and it had to be one who was righteous we could not even shed our own blood only the spotless lamb of God Thank God for the blood of the Lamb that washes our sins away. Remember, be grateful, and drink all of it. 
copies of today's service are available in audio and video formats. Call us toll free at 1-877-OLIVE-BC to place your order. Dr. Trailer's sermons, along with information about Olive, are also available on the internet by visiting olivebaptist.org.